So what's on the Bloom calendar? What's blooming? Or focuses. Lo who said that? <laughs> Lauren. Lauren, you saw them up? Yep. Snowdrops are, are, are blooming. Oh, yes. Yeah, those are out. Bees, are, of course, can't fly. No. Point, but, but yeah, those are cro crocus will, will be the first thing they can um, um, actually get at at this point. And, and also, I noticed that we're getting a little bit of um, bud growth on, on the fruit trees, which is a little early. And we do have the sugar maples, or not the sugar maples, the silver maples are turning red. Which means that they're they're about to they'll flower now. I think early this year, probably the end of the month. So another two weeks, maybe a week and a half, and they'll be flowering. And it looks like the way things are going, maybe the bees will be flying by then, pretty regular. Um, before but before we get started, I want to welcome you all here to Bee Talks. My name is Bill Hesbeck. If you haven't been here before, I'm the president of the. Connecticut Beekeepers Association. We also have two other board members on here. Jose Salinas, he's the vice president. And where's Paul? Is Paul still there? Paul Zelinsky. I'm here. Here as the member at large. So uh, a good portion of our board is here. We keep it really lean and um, and fit. So, uh, so, so if you have any questions, of course, and if you want to bring issues through the board, Paul is our, our um, member at large. And he is positioned to take your um, issues I'll, up. I'll put my email in the in the chat. Okay. Um, all right. Cool. So, uh, so we have a. I just want to point people to our website, and I think Jose put that link up. Maybe he maybe he will now. Um, but we have uh, <clears throat> ctps.org slash events or something like that. But I encourage you to take a look at that. We have some really interesting, oh yeah, okay, upcoming. Um, he just posted it in the chat. That's something I encourage you to look at because that will give you a good idea of who we're gonna bring on this year for the remainder of the year uh, for guest speakers. And also we have two live events that we're gonna hold at the Ag Station in New Haven. One is on October 21st. That's gonna be with a friend of mine Cameron Jack, who just did a bunch of wonderful work on oxalic acid. He's a great speaker. I spent a month with him in Thailand and um, we went all over the countryside looking for exotic apis bees that live in those tropics. And I've gotten to know him well. Um, and I think he's one of the uh, premier scientists in the United States. And a lot of people do also think that about him. So he's on October 21st, then you've got me Speaking first, um, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, a subject that I manage to talk about quite often about beef uh, history, the history of beef flight and and uh, queen mating practices and all of that. And that will be at the Ag Station. So, and, uh, and then Jose came up with a great idea at our board meeting the other night where he suggested that we might want to think about also offering them as Zoom. I'm not sure I'm, we, we're going to do that, though, because I, I want to see if people are, are really geared up to come out in person again, you know, or have they just, uh, are they Zoomed in place, so to speak, you know, um, which I understand. We have a great program planner. She does a wonderful job. We're having Marla Spivak, by the way, in December, and um, a, a, an interesting speaker that's going to discuss how round cells are made in bee colonies um, in November. So uh, really interesting lineup coming up. Then I wanna also encourage you to become a member if you're not. And uh, hopefully you, everybody here is, but, uh, but if you're not, we use those membership funds to do things like uh, maintain our bee yard, which is full of events this year. They'll be posted very soon. The dates, we have about seven dates, I think, in, in the year when we will uh, open a bee yard for people to come and ask questions and learn more about bees and, and do some live beekeeping. We'll do, we'll do uh, varroa counts. We're gonna do some queen rearing this year. Um, we'll, we'll teach folks how to 
how to tell if their colonies are healthy or if they're about to swarm. So there's lots of interesting things that'll occur at the bee yard this year. And that bee yard is located in Cheshire at the Boulder No Farm. So you can get directions for that from our website. And that's listed as um, <clears throat> in that event area. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to um, address the question that I've been getting fairly regularly at this point, because it's been a warm, a warm winter. Um, it's actually been a no winter. Uh, but <clears throat> um, I just wanted to let everybody know about how bees behave in environments like this. And when, when we want to control the minimum amount, or the let's say if we want bees to winter in the best possible condition, they would winter in the 40s, in that, in that temperature range, around anywhere between 38 and 42 degrees. And the reason for that is that at those temperatures, just around 40, <clears throat> bees use the least amount of resources in the colony. They're, they're not moving much and they're not heating much. They're too cold to be moving a lot, and, but they're warm enough so that they don't have to heat a lot, right? So if the temperature falls below say 36 degrees or so, or in that area, bees begin to form real tight clusters. And in those real tight clusters, they begin to use a lot of fuel to keep warm. Now, oddly enough, if it goes below that, the cluster tightens up even more. And at that point, they get into an ultra low metabolic rate and actually use a little bit less honey. So it's in those ranges that we normally experience in winter that would use the most honey. If you go really below that, uh, some interesting biological things happen in the colony that, that um, conserve a little bit of um, stores. Now, above 40, bees start to think about um, moving out of the colony and they'll get they'll they'll start to congregate on the front entrance and in the 50s they'll take little flights cleansing flights and um, of course that activity uses a little bit more um, energy than than would be at <clears throat> if they were just sort of in that state at 40 degrees right so bees will use more energy as it gets warmer and more energy as it gets colder but right at 40 and in the 40s and where we've been this winter should be pretty optimal for bees overwintering. Does that make sense? To anybody? Anybody? Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. So that's where we've been. So I think that this winter, we've probably, our bees have probably used, if you compared it to a decade of wintering, that this, this winter, our bees have probably used less of their stores than they normally would have used in normal winters where we got, you know, real long stretches of cold. Now that could still come up, right? And then, you know, we usually, that's the way things flip, right? We might have a horrible March, a snowy and cold March. That could happen, but we're on the verge of moving through our, our winter. As far as I know, the next 10 days, um, our temperatures in the 40s and 50s and really, really interesting temperature profiles for the next 10 days. And that would be February 20th or so by the time, if, if it ever, if it does break, it will break at the end of February, maybe, and we'll get a week or two of cold weather, but that wouldn't be enough to really um, uh, get bees to use a lot of their stores. So I'm not suggesting that you don't go look because you have a perfect opportunity tomorrow or Saturday. Bees are going to be at that perfect temperature on Saturday, about 40 or so. And you can get in there and look and see, or heft your colonies and see what kind of food you have. This is the time that if they need food, um, you need to supply it because you can starve them from here to March. All right. So March is a dying month for bees because they starve out, but it's 100% avoidable because you can actually feed. Right. And um, but you have to make that determination right now. So take advantage of this warm weather and next week's warm weather to figure out if your bees need something to eat and get out there and put something in there. 
like um, a, I recommend you use a um, cake, sugar cake, which the ingredients and the um, recipe are on our website, on our resources, I believe. And, it'll, and it gives you a, um, a wonderful um, uh, uh, formula for just a cake, right? Which is pretty, pretty easy to put together, right? So if you want to try that, right? So Bill, at this time, do we give one to one or two to one still? Well, you're not going to be able to feed uh, liquid syrup at this point. Unless you have an in high fear, you're not, no, you can't feed liquid. It's too, it's too early to feed liquid. You have to put in a um, form of um, sugar, sucrose. Um, you know, so, yeah. yeah, you got to put in a form of sucrose. Oops. Any other questions about that? Um, Bill, this is Lauren. Yeah, Lauren. Um, yeah, I'd like to say something about that. I'll actually um, actually put, try to put this on camera. So I use the condensing hives that you you know wrote the article about and the top of the con condensing hive i don't know if i'm gonna make this visible is like an inner cover that is i don't know is that on um, uh, yeah we can see it. it's like a shim with screening and this is how i make my cakes i made this one this morning and this is the one that has the pollen in it okay. and i really like this method because um, I put the newspaper on the bottom on top of the wire, and then I pack in the, um, in this case, sugar and a little bit of pollen. Uh, and when I put it on the hive, the sugar cake can absorb some moisture and then and the newspaper as well. Um, so I didn't have enough. I have eight colonies now, and I don't have that many condensing yeah. boxes. But even on my boxes that aren't condensing, I had more of these I mean, some people can do it themselves. I don't have woodworking skills, but I had more of these shims with the hardware cloth. Um, I think it's quarter inch, right? Um, oh, is it quarter inch or one eighth? Oh, one eighth, one eighth. Um, I had some of those made. So even on the boxes that where I don't have the condensing, I use this where I would put an inner cover and then put a piece of insulation and then the regular telescoping outer cover. But um, I find these to be an incredibly convenient way to um to feed and because i can't leave them alone i feed whether they need it or not so i just keep the food on there <laughs> but i just uh i think it's really useful so i just thought i would share that Long yeah, before no, you nice. walk away from that would you like to just zoom in on that a little bit so people can see it a little bit clearer yeah let me let me try to put the computer down so um so that's three you would that's for three different Colonies, so right? This is one inner cover. So oh, let me just the bottom. So this is one inner cover. This is I was laying it on newspaper. So this is the bottom of the inner okay, cover. Yeah. All right. And it's um you know whatever that is, whatever your directions were, like maybe an inch. Yeah. It would sit right where an inner cover would sit. Right. Um, I put it on and you know just lie it down. They don't fall out. And so then this sugar is at the very top of the hive and then a piece of insulation and then the outer cover. Okay. And um, like before I put this on, I'll trim all this extra newspaper off. Yeah. Um, but I like to have, I like to have the newspaper because it absorbs, you know, more water. I don't use ventilation, um, but I think it's a, I don't know, very useful way to feed. And so what are your results like? I mean, I'm eight for eight right now. Um, they've no, I'm saying, do they, do they come up and, so you have a piece of newspaper that's on the wire. So that's the newspaper. They don't come in contact with the newspaper, right? So this is going, this side is what is facing the top bars. Oh, okay. All right. I was a little confused. All right. right. So the, the top bars with the top of the second deep where the bees are, they're going to come right up and eat this. Okay, good. Deep. Now I got it. Yeah. Um, so did they, do they eat it? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They absolutely eat it. Yeah. Okay. So, so I had more of these made and were you going to say something? No, I wasn't oh. going to say, I was going to say that that's, I mean, if you're, if you're determined to, to feed them, that's a great way to feed them. Yeah. I, I don't know. I can't not. <laughs> I'm a helicopter parent, sadly. 
I get that, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I expect that from you, Lauren, yeah. because Plus, you know, one time a million years ago, uh, you said that there was some data that the bees that were fed the sugar cake actually did better than the bees that had their. Honey. Yeah, so you only have to say it once, Bill. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. You also well, once said to use blue windshield wiper fluid for the alcohol wash, and you never redacted that comment. So I had to wait till I hear, heard you say, oh my God, why are you using that? I'm yeah, gonna... I know, I should have redacted that comment <laughs> um, because now, now um, the wash solution that I recommend for Varro, we're on a different subject now, but um, would be a Randy Oliver's formula of, um, dish detergent in water. Or if you want to splurge, 90% alcohol. Those two are about equivalent. The, the really interesting part about using the Randy's tests, he did a thousand colonies and tested the drop, the drops of Varroa in all of them. And then he tested all of the different specific gravity weights of all of those different uh, washes you could use, including 70% um, isopropyl alcohol, 90%, and then the detergent piece. And the detergent piece wins out because it has surfactants in it, which wet the varroa and allow them to fall through the liquid faster and without any agitation at all, actually. So the surfactant does the job that alcohol doesn't have surfactant in it at all. It just does a good job of killing Varroa and they fall off. But if you wanted to kill them and move them through the liquid fast to get them to the bottom, most efficiently, you would use the cheapest version out there, which is his formula of, I don't have that formula. Maybe if somebody wants to look that up in, on Randy's site, it's on there, scientificbeekeeping.com. Uh, and uh, post it in the chat, you can see that. So that's what I would recommend today. All right, so listen, that's great. But the message is the same. Make certain that you take an opportunity right now. And if you wanna do what Lauren did and proactively feed them, go ahead. And that shim is critical that she showed you because that shim will give um, the bees Gives, gives her the opportunity to keep the bees off of the insulation that she puts under her telescoping cover. And that helps because that keeps the, the sugar cake that she's made and um, the top of the colony warm enough so that the water then, the water that's, uh, that some of it diffuses through that material that she has but it keeps the top warm enough so that it doesn't moisture doesn't drop back down on the bees. Now I'm sure you found that to be true. Is that right, Lauren? Okay. All right. You don't because that's the situation you don't want to have. You don't want to have a cold inner cover and um, and a hot moist air getting up there and um, wetting your bees. All right. So. All right. So um, did we sufficiently cover that, Jose? I think we did. <laughs> Um, uh, let's, let's <laughs> talk about how we don't want to use heaters on the hives. No, we don't want to use heaters, but before we do that, does anybody else want any, any comments on how they feed or they want to talk about this time of year, um, and, and share with them, some of us like Lauren did what, what they're doing or will do. So, um, so I put, I put a little bit of, um, I opened up the hive the other day. I didn't actually look in, but I took the inner cover off and, uh, put some, sugar on the inner cover and and just spread it around so they could comp and get it but i noticed they haven't really eaten much of it i think they got plenty of stores still yeah that could be one reason why they're not eating it but you put it on the cold side of the inner cover there's no insulation above it i put it on the the cold on the, the cold side of the inner cover but i do have insulation i have some one inch um uh, all right foam, so, foam. so the bees yeah. and there's they're, no they're definitely they're coming up and they're on the foam when i open it up so they're, they're definitely coming up in there. All right. So um, I wanted to tell anybody who's using, what what kind of uh, insulation is that? Just a regular paint? The, the styrofoam? Yeah, it's a one inch, yeah, one inch foam. Yeah, yeah. Uh, styrofoam, whatever. Right. Um, all right. So paint that with paint next when you, when you take it off. All right. So paint the bottom surface of the surface that faces the bees. 
There's a little trick that, that, um, that we've learned from some of the scientists that are doing this work with insulated top covers. And they have announced, and it works, that if you just use a plain old water-based um, paint, any kind of paint, and paint that bare side of the insulation, the extended polystyrene, you will uh, keep bees from chewing it, All right? They only need that little barrier to stop them from chewing it. Because if you leave it like that, Carl, they'll, they'll, they'll start chewing it out, you know? And then they make little dust all over the place and it falls down into the colony and maybe it gets into brood cells. And so that's my, I use a foil faced uh, insulation, which prevents them from eating the, the um, out the, um, Boom. All right, but ants and bees love to chew that stuff. A little bit of paint stops them. All right. Anything else? Anybody else want to, uh, before we leave this subject and open it up for? Uh, Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. It's Karen. How are you? Oh, Karen. Good. Thank you. Good. Quick, one quick question. Could you just repeat what you just said? Do you put the sugar cakes right I put the sugar cakes right on top of the frames. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. As long as you have a shim on top of it, right? I just put, sat it right on top of the frames. Okay. So how do you, then what, then what do you do? Well, they were the hard frozen, you know, I did the formula where I let it dry out and they were like little bricks. Okay. But how much, so, but how do you fit them on there without with the, so then. Oh, we, yes. No, what? then I have, right. I, my husband built a one inch uh, shim. shim, right. And then I did what I do, what you do with the insulation. I followed your theory. Okay. So then um, that's the same as what Lauren's doing. Okay. Okay. Great. I was a little bit more left. You could take Lauren's and serve it at a restaurant. I mean, it's so beautiful. Yes. My gosh. <laughs> it looks beautiful. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks a lot, Bill. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay. But again, the message is, and I want to beat this to death so you know, because I don't want you to lose your bees to starvation, because it is the single thing that is under our control as animal husbandry-ish people, is to keep your bees from starving to death. We Lots of times we can't keep them from dying from virus loads or varroa or other diseases that might occur in the colony, but this is one that is totally 100% under, under our control. All right. Let's talk about, um, let's open it up to anything you want to talk about at this point, please. So somebody is asking somebody. So let's look through other, if there's questions in the chat, Jose, that we should look at. Yes, talk about how, why we don't want to heat the beehives. Well, who's suggesting that they heat them? Well, the question is, how do you feel about those heaters for hives? Which kind of heater? I mean, I had one eighty one. Would you like to elaborate? Yes, please, because I'm wondering what you're what you're actually talking about. If you were talking putting up like putting a forty white light bulb under the colony, or what what it is you're talking about? It's it's the heaters that um, Mike Spee sold. Yeah. Not a good idea. How come? Well, because um, first of all, those heaters are not, um, they're not UL approved. Okay. All right, they require extension cords to run out into the colony. Yeah. And all over the ground in the winter time. And those connections are subject to electrocuting people. <laughs> you know, so you have to be very careful about how you arrange all of those interconnections um, you just should know that part of my um, previous life in um, uh, in my earlier career, I was I worked for Western Electric as an equipment installer, and in that period, I got a master electrician's license. So, I'm, so that's a real. So, I was I actually objected to those when I saw them, um, and I don't think they're a good idea. And you don't have any control over heat. Right, so I thought it kept it at 40 degrees. Well, that's, so it might keep it at 40 degrees if it's 38 out. 
what does it keep it at when it's 52 or 60 or you know when we get these when we get these big spots i mean there's not a, i don't think there's a thermal i don't think there's a thermostat in it but i just object to the fact that it needs to be um, electrified in an unconventional way and i don't know since you can't see the heating elements or anything like that whether or not and since it's not not been through any underwriting laboratory um, testing, I don't know if that would just catch fire and burn your house down, burn your colony down. Don't know. Good to know. Thank Sorry you. Sorry about that. Okay. I mean, there was other, there was other schemes that people uh, discuss, especially on the internet, about putting, uh, you know, 40 white light bulbs underneath their colonies and all of that. So I would, I would say that your bees do not need supplemental heat. What they need is insulation, and that insulation can help them maintain exactly the temperature they want. They're wonderful at being able to regulate and ventilate their own colony uh, based on the way that they sense their microclimate. And they've evolved over millions of years to regulate that uh, hive gases, including CO2. The re reason I'm saying hive gases is because I'm including their, when they, from metabolism when they exhale CO2 in their colony, and they also generate heat. They know exactly how to, how to manage the ventilation in minute quantities of moving air in and out of the colony. Um, so All right, thank you. Bill, I just wanna share a picture of what the insulation looks like when the bees have access to it. Yeah, they chew it out. They chew it all out. So just a little, bit of paint works wonders. Yeah, a little paint. If you painted that with the latex paint, you got it. Paint it a nice color too, because they got to stare at it, you know, and that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, Dean. I'm sorry, Dean. Uh, so what else do we have here? I have a question for you. Um, I lost one of my hives this year. And there was lots of stores and, and stuff. So when I, I did order a new package, um, so when, when I started with packages before, I started just from scratch. I didn't have any comb or anything like that. Uh, do you recommend I just go ahead and, and put, leave some empty comb and some stores and then put, put the package in there? Or should I start from scratch again? Well, the, the, the package that you... The colony that died, do you have, did it have a brood disease of any kind? Um, I did, I did have some chalk brood in there, um, but I don't think that's why it died. I think it was just a mite overload. I, I didn't control them very well. I, I think that's the problem. Yeah, that, that would, that could kill your bees. Well, chalk brood is a fungus. Yes, I'm aware. And, um, but that won't be a problem for you. So you can reuse, you can reuse uh, frames that have had chalk brood on them. And actually bees will clean it out. Um, um, I don't, if it's an act, when I find an active infection of chalk brood, now chalk brood um, makes these little hard mummies out of your bees. And they first are white and then they're black. And when they're in black in that phase, they're full of uh, fungal spores and you'll find them on your, um, uh, landing boards. If you have a if you have a high uh, infection, these will clean them out of the cells, carry them down, and throw them out of the colony. But you'll see a lot of them on the landing board. An active chalk brood infection will normally go away on its own. There's no treatment for it. And if you still have chalk brood, Carl, in any of the frames, if those if you can see it in there, right? It's the mummy. It yep. looks like it looks like a little. Um, I don't know. How do you describe it? It looks like a little, it looks like a, like a larva would be, a pupa would be a pre-pupa, but it's hard and calcified uh, or, or fungi fungified, <laughs> I guess you could say. Yeah. So um, what you I can, did was You can reuse I, the combs then. You okay. can reuse them if, as long as they're clean. Okay. Yeah. There's only a, a couple in there. Um, I, I think they clean most of it out. But I, I did see a couple when I stored the with the combs. Okay, but you don't use those because okay. those will have active fungus on it. Okay. All right. So just use the ones that um, that um, 
that are clear of any actual mummies, they call okay. them. Okay. All right, so take, if the mummies are, are out of them, you can use them. And so then how put, put a few uh, frames in there that are, are foundation frames, so you can get them to start drawing. Okay, so pictures. just put uh, two or three foundation frames in the middle? Yeah. And then put, put some in, feet on the outside, and then... Yeah, and, um, you know, like, so I might not, if I have drawn comb, I might not even feed a colony, especially if I have lots of stores. But I would suggest that you actually put um, some food on that colony when you put in your package. Yeah, okay, thanks. That's what I did in the beginning. Okay, yeah. thank you. Do the same thing now. Let them draw some comb off your feed. All right, let's get back to Dean. Dean had a question up there. I don't want to, Dean, what was it? Advice on best way to control moisture over the winter, quilt box. Oh, quilt boxes. Dean, you had to ask that. Sorry, so, and Dean, I don't know about this. I like that. Um, so quilt boxes have, an, they're interesting, it's an interesting misconception about quilt boxes. I'm not going to get in my bandwagon, but I want to let you know that quilt boxes were originally designed by Warre, who is a French um, uh, beekeeper who wanted to make a colony, a hive box that was better than a Langstroth box and better than uh, log hives or anything else that was being um, uh, used at the time. And he invented the Warre hive, what he refers to as the people's hive. And you can, you can get his book. It's, it's a really little tiny book and you can read it in a, in a couple of nights. And he explains all of this, but he actually invented that quilt box for exactly the purpose its name implies, quilting the colony for heat, all right? So that was its normal intent. But then what folks discovered is that, and the original quilt boxes, by the way, had interesting um, kind of canvases that they used. The quilt box, I think the one you made, Dean, did it have a screen on the bottom or does it have cloth? I, I, oh, lost, have colonies. I lost colonies to, to moisture over the, over the winter. Okay. And I don't want that to happen again. So I'm like, I'm basically asking, what do I need to do so that I don't have that problem again? Well, if you're going to, if, if you truly lost them to moisture, which I, I'd have, you know, I, so I, I'd want to see that. If you see a dead colony with a lot of moisture in it, it came from the bees. So bees, when they die, about 80% of their body cavity is moist, is water. And because they can't, they don't have an active um, system, biological system, the moisture comes out through their spiracles and out of the little uh, non-hardened sections and it comes into that. It always looks like a colony that died, say, in December or January, when you get around to looking at it in March, it's soaking wet and it's wet because the bees died and the moisture came out of their body. Now, the other way that bees can die from that situation is if you had no insulation on the top and um, the bees had a, a moisture stream that came off of them, you know, hot air rose up against the inner cover and the inner cover was cold because there was no insulation and it and the vapor turned into liquid moisture and ran back down on the top of those frames. If that occurred, right, then you can then then that's a that's a moisture problem. That's solved by insulation. All you have to do is keep the top of your colony above the dew point. And the bees will manage the moisture the rest of the way. Glorious. Oh, thank you. So, but quilt boxes are interesting in that they use a principle called diffusion. And um, the liquid vapor goes up through the quilt and ends up uh, condensing on the top half inch or so of whatever you put in there. So thus wood shaving, whatever it is you put in there. So people that run quilt boxes are always amazed at the fact that the particles, the, the fill they use is dry right below the first half inch or so and that the and that the first half inch is wet and moist and that's because that's the coolest part of the quilt box and since diffusion which is the way vapor moves through surfaces without turning into water right it, it goes all the way through those the quilt box till it hits something that's below the dew point and it, from there it, it um 
it will um, condense out as liquid. But my suggestion is use insulation instead of a quilt box because that moisture that we think is our, the enemy to our bees will really um, benefit them over the winter because they use it to thin honey when it's inside the colony. As a matter of fact, when vapor turns into liquid washer, it gives off latent heat. So it's a heat recovery system that the bees are really um, uh, good at doing. All right, we got some hands up. Is that enough? Yeah, let's go to Walter uh, before the rest of the questions in the chat. Walter, go ahead. Hi, uh, my first meeting. Um, I'm starting an apiary in Cheshire. I'm wondering if bears will be an issue. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you why, Walter. Because my apiaries are in Cheshire and I have fences around them, so they're going to go to yours. Yeah, I'm actually just about a mile west down down Boulder Road there on, on um, Coleman Road. You are. I run down the road. That's I do. I run do marathon trainings. I run by. I, I saw the bee yard a few times already. Got All a nice right. I, fence around it. <laughs> I don't like Walt already because he's going to be making honey hand over fist in that area. We're going to be there on Saturday. Stick. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay. Right. And then, so electric oh. fence. Yes, we'll do. Yeah, yeah, I, I would just do it out of a abundance of caution. Yeah, yeah, better per to prevent than try and fix it after it happens. I've never seen a bear um, in our area okay. in, in 30 years. Okay, see that now that makes me think I might not need the fence, but I know you, it, it might make you think that, but I'm, I'm telling you again, yeah. mine are all fenced. So if they're going to okay. come and get somebody, they're going to get you. <laughs> okay, all right, thanks. <laughs> all right. Uh, Colleen asks, what do you think about flow hives? And in time for that question, I think Sylvia just recently joined us. So Sylvia's Sylvia's here to answer that. Oh boy. <laughs> Sylvia, are you here? I am here. <laughs> are, you, are you in good spirits enough to talk about that flow hive or what? Then the Sylvia is our flow hive person, by the way. Why am I well, I'm not necessarily the flow hive person, but I started beekeeping because of being gifted a flow hive right okay, so right. Uh, but i can't queen. say that i'm a poster child of successfully having um extracted honey with a flow hive yet because that would suggest that i've actually successfully gotten my bees to make enough honey for me to keep <laughs> so. okay but i mean i i have warned people that they're uh the the I do agree that it's unnecessary to get the entire flow hive and um, first make sure that you've got decent brood boxes going. And I haven't in the two years so far, I haven't actually tapped used my flow super. Okay, so that that's a really important part. Whoever it is that's thinking about a flow hive, the flow hive is not a new invention, nor is it a way to keep bees. It is just a alternative to how you harvest honey out of your colony, if you can make it. But what Sylvia said is primarily important. You have to be a beekeeper and get your boxes, your brood boxes up to strength right at the flow. And then I guess you could put your flow hive super on top of those boxes and it might make honey. You know, I don't think, uh, so that's, that's uh, you know, it's, it's a really expensive way <laughs> to try to make honey, uh, but if you've been gifted it, you know, you should try it out. I don't, um, I've seen it work. I've not seen it. Oh, there it is. Yeah, somebody, is that you, Jose? Yeah. There yeah. It, it's you know, really it's pretty. Yeah. So it looks really nice. <laughs> it looks really, <laughs> it's really. And really expensive. And they're very, yeah. very expensive. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, 969. Uh, and that's the Flow Hive 2 Plus, which comes with little jars on the top, I guess, that are already filled with honey. <laughs> I don't I know. Buy my own. I did have to buy my own jars, but. Oh, you had to buy your own jars, so yours didn't come. And, and the honey. bees, the harvest, the, the bees um, aren't included, so. Oh, the bees. Yeah, okay. The bees aren't included either. Now, if you tried that little trick you saw there on Jose's screen share, if you tried that in one of my bee yards when I had, you know, tons of production colonies, you're going to draw soup, soup, honey out into a <laughs> open jar. You're going to find out what beekeeping's like right away. You, you know, you. But you, I will point out that 
I still will at some point I will do a video demo of showing you that I've tapped and my super is working. So I know you I'm will still convinced that that will happen. I, I <laughs> even totally if I agree. have to go and take a, a purchase a bottle of honey from Stop and Shop and squirt it down my <laughs> super. Well, I don't think it's legal unless it comes out of the comb. All right, so I don't know who asked that question about the- That was blow, Colleen. Glow Hive. Um, yep. So Colleen, if you're thinking about, um, if you're thinking that a Flow Hive is something special, the way they've advertised it is that it's an alternative uh, way to keep bees, but it isn't because a Flow Hive is nothing but um, a honey super. And it has little crank handles on it that if you, um, if you get bees to build comb, they don't build comb and fill it with honey in that flow hive. Then it, then when you actually manipulate that little handle, it splits the cell in half and the honey is supposed to drain out. Now, if honey crystallizes in a flow hive, I have no idea what you would do. If bees, if it leaks bees somehow, and bees get up into that flow hive or the queen gets up there and starts laying out brood, um, I don't know what you would do. Um, I guess that you would have to scrap those frames because I guess they're individual frames, right, Sylvia? Yeah, but yeah, there's ways to, I mean, you can you can strip them apart and, and clean them and stuff. But I mean, I think the biggest, I mean, last season, I, I put them on for a little bit. And even after the advised waxing of all of the frames, so I'd actually put beeswax on the frames. Okay, yeah. The bees didn't, the bees really didn't take yet. So, I mean, I'll try playing with it again over the next, this next season, assuming I have bees actually to, to harvest honey from. But, but you know, um, I think the biggest, the bigger challenge is first getting, you know, critical mass on your, your hives and then making Absolutely. sure they're healthy. And then, and then, I mean, lesson learned is then if I had gotten, if I'd gotten, I could have waited and then just bought the flow super. Yes. Yes. Right. If you were determined to use that process, that's a, that would be a great way to, to introduce yourself on, but you know, you can learn how to do it with a regular honey super first and then go over to hive super if it's too much of a problem for you. Cause lots of times, you know, it's, it's, if you have a, uh, even a medium, I, I, I saw in their advertisement that they said, you know, you can get 46 pounds out of 46 pounds of honey out of a, a flow hive. Well, I can get 60 out of a medium box. So and here's a, here's a close up of the side of one of those frames. And as you can see here, uh, you, you harvest the honey by turning the, the, that handle that Bill's talking about. And what it does is it splits the cells into two. You see, this is one, one half of one cell right here. Yeah. And this is the other. And so when you, when you split it like that, of course, the honey flows all the way down here into this channel down here, which, which then flows out this way. And uh, one of the things that you will notice happen when you do this, because the, the bees are on the frames when you do this, when you, when you uh, break the cells and uh, to extract the honey, uh, when you break the cells like that, as well as you close them back up again, the bees are in there trying to get at that honey and you will crush bees in between these cells once the cells begin to uh, join together again. Yes, you got to be careful. But the, the really the real advantage of this particular system where the, it takes a lot of time for the honey to flow down into that channel. Yeah. You can go, you can, you run back into the house to get your pancakes, <laughs> bring them back out and put them under Sil the nozzle. Just Sylvia, like we're still waiting for those pancakes. I'm going to show you. It's going to happen. I know. All right. I know. Uh, let's, let's go to Gail. Gail's question is, should insulation be removed during the warmer weather? You don't have to necessarily ever remove insulation on the top. I run it all year long on the top of all my colonies. It serves the same purpose in the summer as it does in the winter, except it's the opposite um, uh, heat flow. In the winter, you're trying to keep the heat in the colony. In the summer, you're trying to heat, keep the heat off the colony. And it does a, job, a good job of doing it both ways. If you think about the way Bees live in a tree naturally. 
they never change their insulation uh, amount. It, there's always the same amount. There's almost an infinite amount of insulation above bees in a tree and below usually. And on the sides, there's a nice R15 or so of wood around bees. So yeah, you don't ever have to remove the top insulation. I suggest you try to keep it on if you can. If you have a um, cover that is insulated, leave it on there. There's a couple of interesting options for you. Be smart. Design has some you might want to take a look at. That's an inner cover that replaces your inner cover and that is insulated and you can leave that on all year long. Um, you can look at BMAX covers. Those are, you can leave those on. Those are insulated. They're really light and, the, um, and they'll blow away. So you have to make sure you weight them down. But those are insulation covers made out of uh, polystyrene and you can leave those on all year. So um, yeah, lots of ways to keep insulation on your colony all year long. So yeah, you don't have to take it off. And the, there, it, there was, and I heard, I heard some, um, I heard somebody say this once, or I've heard, I've heard it many times. Said, "Oh, I think my bees died because I left the insulation on." Absolutely not happening. No. Next question. It's like it's, like it's, it's, a, it's as if you took, you said, "Well, I'm going to take the insulation out of my walls uh, when it when I don't need it for the winter time." You know, you just it, that's it doesn't make any sense. And insulation works both ways, and if it's if there's a median temperature, it stays at a median temperature. Right. Uh, next okay. question. Uh, I have several dead outs that have ample stores. Can I use those frames of capped honey when I install new packages this spring? Yes. And if I reuse the frames of capped honey for new packages, do I also have to feed one to one? Well, if you have lots of capped honey, like let's say you have full frames of capped honey, 70 pounds a piece or something, and you put four of those in, on the outside frames, one, two, nine, and 10, say for instance, if you have a 10 frame colony. And then in the middle, that leaves you with six frames. And if you have all drawn comb in those six frames, you'll have, or, or if you have, like I sometimes do have <clears throat> access to pollen frames, pollen frames that have nice capped pollen in them, nice shiny pollen, not the, not the raw stuff. Um, but a shiny coating on it, which means that the bees have made bee bread out of it and then they've sealed it with a little bit of honey. So that's that's a that's a stable long-term storage way that bees use to store pollen, right? When it's raw, they just stick it in a comb, uh, stick it in a um in the cell, and you'd be able to see the difference. You can tell the difference very easily. Uh, maybe somebody could show find a picture of that and, and put it up. But anyway, um if you have that pollen, then you would put that next. Let's say you had a couple frames of pollen. So you'd have one, two, um, frame one and two, counting from whichever direction you want as food stores, then a pollen frame. And then the same thing on the other side, uh, two frames of food storage uh, or honey, and then a pollen frame. And then the middle then now wouldn't be six frames anymore, be four, four empty comb in the middle there. and that's that would be the ideal setup for a new package. Good comb, no diseased comb or anything like that, but good comb, youngish side, and um, plenty of stores. You would not have to feed that colony because they will use the honey that's in it. You know, you could feed them if you wanted to, but um, you wouldn't have to. I've successfully installed packages, many, many, many packages in setups like that. Next question. I have a nuke that looks like it might survive the winter. Is there a certain time in the spring that I should move them into a deep or just on a warm day? You never have to do anything with that nuke if it overwinters. You can leave it as a nuke or you can plop it into some colony you want to plop it into. You can harvest the bees out of it. You can harvest brood out of it. You can do lots of things with that nucleus colony. You don't have to ever change it. It'll stay small if you leave it in a nuke it might swarm um but um but it's not necessarily uh it's not necessary to move it out of that configuration but let's say you want to grow it into a uh, full-size colony with 10 frames or something in it then i would take that nuke and i'd plop it into a um middle of a 10 frame colony and i would do that as soon as the weather permitted 
as soon as we have constant temperature over like say 60 degrees or something like that. Because that colony can actually thermoregulate on its own and everything because it's a full size nuke and might have you know, 15,000 bees in it. But before I did that, I'd make sure that the queen has is laying out a nice pattern and that the colony looks healthy and all that before I tried to grow it into a full size colony. And then I might even feed it for a week or two once I put it in uh, with foundation. If I put it in with drawn, you know, cause I would wanna um, just let them use some sugar water one-to-one -to, -one to draw wax on the new frames, that's all. Uh, next question and Lynn's Pat, I know you got your hand up, but let's let's see if we can get a couple more things before we get to you. So the next question is, what are the ideal conditions to make walkaway splits in early spring? Do you recommend keeping the queen in the mother colony or move the queen into the split? I recommend using leaving the uh, mother queen, uh, taking the mother queen and put her in the split <clears throat> and leaving the colony. Um, so, well, how would it, this is a walkaway split? Did they say they wanted to make uh, a walkaway split? Okay, so in a, let's explain what a walkaway split is first. So a walkaway split is when you say, I'm going to let the bees make their own queen. So I'm going to actually split this colony like 50-50, right? Let's say you're doing it that way. And, and we're, you're going to have basically half the colony with the, the, the queen. Now that, that, that's, I want more information about how they want to make this split. I'm sorry. I got off on something that I, I shouldn't have. Go ahead. Who, who, how do they want to make it? They want to make it into a nuke? Helen, you want to speak up? Yes. Hi, I have six colonies that have made it through so far. Um, I'd like to prevent swarming. I had a few swarms last year. Um, and I have some equipment so that I could have more colonies. So, but basically I wanna prevent swarming if I can. Um, so I'm thinking ahead and wondering, is it best to do a, a walk away split early spring and let them make their own queen? Or is it better to wait until I see swarm cells and then try to do a split? So you have, well, you're gonna you're gonna get overwhelmed with the uh, I know it's swarm cells piece because you're gonna have six colonies and they're all gonna be making swarm cells. Four of them are gonna be making swarm cells. Oh my god! Yeah, so, so is it be best to be pro to do it proactively and well, early well so yeah, so you can um, <clears throat> the best way to prevent <clears throat> the urge to swarm, in my opinion, is to harvest brood out of those okay. colonies. But then you have to figure out where you're gonna put it. Because if you have six live colonies, yep. and, and they're if they're all the same strength, none of them will need brood, you know, especially if they come right. to robust. So yep. the first thing you can try to do early in the season is equalize the colonies because there's got to be some that come through a little bit weaker than others. And what yes, I, I yes, I see there are a couple that aren't quite as strong, but then I've got a couple that look like um, I remember last spring there was someone here and we showed, you showed pictures of his colonies. They were crazy huge. Yeah. I forget who he was. And I think mine are gonna look like that. They're so big. There are two that are really, I can just tell by the activity in front. And when I did a last oxalic acid, that it was amazing. Yeah, so see, there it is. I mean, that's a great way. Um, so Helen, just, just then explain to the group what you mean by you could tell by the way it looked? Um, well, first of all, one of them, I have overwintered in three deep boxes. I've never had to do that. They're, they just were in the spring. I think there was just one queen. I could never find the queen because there were bees everywhere. So when we did oxalic acid in November, I lifted the first deep box, the, you know, when I took off the inner cover, the frames were covered with bees. So then we took off the first box <clears> and then we took off the second box. I had to dribble. I did more dribbling than you're supposed to because there were so many bees 
Right. And the, and the dribble, the dribble is a maximum of 35 grams. Yes. I mean, there wasn't, I couldn't possibly, so I actually used more than I'm supposed to because okay. there were so many bees. So that was an example. Like there were just bees everywhere. Everywhere. All right. Yeah. So you, you, you probably could have crunched them down into two boxes, but that's okay. I, it's hard to okay. do at that time of season. If you've already put yeah. three boxes on your colonies, you're going to have a hard time yeah. moving brood down into two boxes. So I suggest you never do that. If you, right. Not the, a colony that. never needs more than one box, actually. Okay. M one of my solutions for your problem right now is to find that queen in those boxes that are. Oh my there. God. Okay. Find those queens, cage them, and bring them to me. I, I'll, I'll <laughs> just, I'll help you with them. Walter needs a few, few be, a few queens like that near me, and all those. No, okay. anyway, I'm just kidding. But um, yeah, so you're gonna have to so. You want to, you're going to concentrate on your biggest colonies your All right. ones, and you're going to harvest brood out of them early in the season. They're probably already brooding up pretty good. I think they are. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, so make sure everything is clean. There's no okay. disease in any of those colonies. It's, clearly they're not uh, struggling from disease or else they wouldn't be that big. And then those right. are the colonies. You take that brood out. You cannot damage that colony by taking you know, every couple of weeks, taking a couple frames of brood out of those, out of those okay. real boomers and giving them to the weaker colonies and then trying to just equalize your yard out. Now, okay. it could be that you're going to be putting, by the way, when you take um, those frames out of brood, yep. take them out with the nurse bees on them. So take all the bees okay. that are on those frames and move them with, with, with the frame into okay. the Okay. Yep. Yeah. So you yep. got it because you got to give, if you're going to give a weaker colony brood, you got to give yep. them bees to take care of it. And we'll uh, have I hope I can I hope I can find the queen in there. I mean, it's just crazy. Oh no, you don't give them the queen. No, I know. That's what I'm saying. I'm going to be nervous that I the queen, what if I can't find her? You're going to not do that. Right. Okay. Don't do that. <laughs> My husband will come and, and help me look. All right, one, one, one way to figure out if you have the queen on that frame or not is make certain that you're taking capped brood. All right, older capped brood. Now, I'm not okay. yeah. and so minimum amount of smoke, yeah. older capped brood. That's what you want. Now, I'm, what I'm saying to you is it's not a guarantee, but it's not likely that you'll find the queen on a frame with a lot of cap brood on it, both sides right. cap, say for instance, because she's now has no business there. Right. She can't, she can't lay there at all, right? Yeah. So, but examine it very closely. And every time you take brood out of those colonies, go back in about four or five days and look for emergency cells. Okay. Then you yep. know you put the queen in another colony. So, <laughs> and you don't want to do that. No, I don't. Yeah, just make sure you don't do that. Hey, All right. To to isolate the queen, she could put another a box on top. Yeah. Yep. And and put a queen excluder between yes. that box. I thought about that. Move the brood up there. Yeah. And observe in a week or so and see if you have any eggs up there. Yep. And then and you then can look below and see if you have eggs down there. At least you'll know which box the queen is in. Correct. That's a good idea. Yeah, you can do it yeah. that way. Um, you'll know which. Yeah, but you got to remember now. She's, a, a, you know, you're going against the clock here, Helen. So yeah, whatever right. you do, you can't take a lot of time analyzing because you're going to get swarm cells. Right. right? So, so, so but when that's a great. Well, that? Kurtz, that's a great suggestion. Yeah, but yeah. adding that extra box though, and splitting some of the brood away, they they will tend to think that. Yeah, that that's that's less compact. Well, yeah, assume, assuming that they, that you, and if you put them on a double screen and flew them, that would be um, more of a, you'd, you'd have them farther away, but you're still going to have a lot of queen firmo going through the colony. So I'm not suggesting it won't work. I like it. That's, by the way, how you can make a split also. I have so done that. The double screen board. Actually, I, I could try that. I could do that too. I have a double screen sense. board. Yeah, well, you can keep, you can definitely control your bees. Oh, maybe, okay. With that. Okay, right? I haven't but, even thought of that. All right. And you can make a lot of honey. Yeah, I know. But then you make but a you tower. Know, the, problem, the problem I had when I used a double screen board was when it was time to treat. I was doing it because I didn't have <laughs> enough. And, and you, there were just way too many boxes. We were pulling out a ladder to get to the boxes. And they're heavy. And you know, there's lots of disadvantages to that. Yes, 
yeah, I, I don't think I would do that again that way to have that. Yeah, but there's a there's a technique for making a split. I just want to, because folks might be up against this in the spring, so. All right, thank you very much yeah. for all these su suggestions. Well, I'm, I'm going to talk. I'll just let you about, know. Yeah, yeah, let us know, Helen. And okay. then, right. like I said, if you're really in trouble with those bees, you can, you know, always, uh, uh, or even give us a frame of brew, you know, who knows? We'll bring it up to the comments. All right, just anyway, one more question um, before we go over to uh, Lynn's pad. So uh, uh, iPhone wants to know, uh, since they're new to beekeeping, when should they get their bees? And it's a question of whether we have a bee school in March. So this is a good opportunity for me to talk about uh, a link that I'm just putting in the chat right now. We just finished our bee school in January, which was a really great uh, event. And anyone who is interested in viewing the session, because we had one session every Saturday in January, uh, uh, you uh, can, they were recorded and you can view them. If you click on that link, uh, I can't join if you click on that link, I'm just gonna mute Sylvia because, I got you know, uh, uh, we are uh, making those available for those who couldn't make it uh, for a, a $40 charge uh which really is a bargain so if you if you haven't made plans to get your bees yet uh you need to get cracking you need to get your bees uh as soon as possible and you, first of all you ought to get your e equipment ready for the bees if you haven't gotten your equipment yet um uh so and there's still enough time for you to place orders with uh beekeepers commercial beekeepers who are uh, uh selling bees so uh but Getting educated about beekeeping is important, and your first big step is to uh, take a look at our bee school videos. Yeah, and our bee school video include um, world class beekeepers. Dewey Karen is 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 in that. He he gives a wonderful presentation to to the uh, beginning of beekeeping and the biology and all of that. And then we have two sessions, two Saturdays by Randy Oliver, one of the premier. Um, uh, uh, beekeeping scientists and beekeepers. He's an almond pollinator from California. If you don't know who he is, he runs scientificbeekeeping.com. He's widely known across the world as probably the most informed, practical, applying science kind of practical beekeeper that we know. So we have, um, if you're going to go to another bee school and you want you know, which is which is also there are some available. Make certain you understand who your instructor is and what their motive is. You know, if their motive is to keep you is to get you to buy equipment from them, then I suggest you don't go to those B schools. You know, and um, and we do have a few of those around, so be careful. Yeah, we sure do. And All so, right, Lynn's Pat has been patiently waiting for the question. Um, uh, so go go ahead. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Hi. Uh, two quick qu uh, questions. I have a friend of mine who's getting out of the bee business, and he had a lot of hives. He had. Um, he offered me. Well, I actually took him six uh, honey supers that are you know been used and stuff. And you know, like I said, he's given really a lot of other stuff. <clears throat> I've taken those supers, and I have all those frames in a freezer now. Are they safe to use? Once I got you know. Oh uh, yeah, that, that know, that's, that's a good question. Why did he get out of beekeeping then? Lynn? Oh no no. Well, he, he was a uh, arborist, and he sold the arborist business, and you know, he had all this stuff in the barn and stuff, and he, he just couldn't drag it all to his house. He's given some of the stuff to his daughter. I knew him sort of personally, and you know, he just he he reached out. My question is, was he a beekeeper? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. So yeah. why did he stop beekeeping? Did you ask no, him? No, no, no. He's still going to be beekeeping, but he just had so many. I mean, he had like, you know, 200 acres of land over in Roxbury. Okay. He's going to still and be. It was a big operation. He had stuff and he just was getting, I mean, he had a dumpster. He was throwing half the stuff in the dumpster because he couldn't get rid of it. He couldn't take it. Some yeah. people didn't want it. Right. So I took, I took the six supers, honey supers with the frames. The frames look great. But I have drawn, the frame. drawn, drawn comb. Yeah, drawn, beautiful. So I took them all. They're all sitting in the freezer now. I mean, I just are they safe to? Uh, I mean, they look very clean. So I just figured I keep them in the freezer till you know. Yeah, freezing them won't get, won't get rid of. Um, uh, the only thing freezing won't get rid of, and the only the only 
caution that you have reusing those frames is if whether or not um, they have American fall brood on them. But you know what? I doubt that. Yeah. I I don't want to say that I condone using uh, equipment from someone else unless I saw their operation. So in other words, yeah. if I knew if I knew there was no American fall brood in that operation at all, right? I would say. But in principle, in principle, it should be okay to freeze them, and assuming that there was no foul brood involved. If there was no American foul brood involved in his apiary yeah. at all, then I think that those frames are okay to use. Okay. Okay. Second question. I am, I, I have four hives. I lost, I just lost three of them. They went belly up and I don't know why. I, I think they probably was a mite situation, even though I treated them last year. Plenty of honey, there's honey all over the place. I got candy boards on top. So anyway, I am in the process now of building um, swarm traps. When is the time or around here then when you should start placing swarm traps out? So I'm trying not to have to buy new bees again, if I can do it. And so I'm not sure the time. So where do you live? Uh, uh, Brookfield. I'm down here by Danbury. You know, so you can put up your swarm traps or leave them up. Yeah, well, I've never done it before. This, I don't know the time frame when I should start Getting them into the tree. Well, I said you can you can make them now. You can put them up anywhere you want. I mean, they bees bees will be ready for them and swarm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Nothing, so just, nothing just, will happen to them. Just put them up. <laughs> okay. You can put them up anywhere you want, anytime. You right. know, I would I would wait. I mean, I wouldn't put them up in, uh, you know, in July. You know, right. but you got to get them up before. I would make sure I, mean, I, I can in get them up before in March, can I? I, mean, I yeah. Just put them you, up there and make sure they're in place before March. But then you know, this is a year. When we could have swarms in March, you know, I don't yeah. know. You know okay. we have, we've had them before, you know, so you can't. Yeah. So get them up early, you know, and <clears throat> make them like out of a a large a deep. Yeah, well, I'm using I'm using some of the deeps that have uh, lost the bees in. I mean, they're clean. I don't know why what happened, but I got the frames on. I'm not actually going to put a bottom on some of those uh, deeps and put hang them up, convert them into a uh, um, swarm hive. Yeah, the, the, the deep work that all out because yeah. they're difficult to get down from a tree, a big colony when it gets a swarm in it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And if you're gonna try to if you're gonna try to collect swarms, you got to be on top of that box all the time. Okay. Thank you. Right? And your first sign is that if you see scout activity on the entrance of that that box, that's the first yeah. time. That, and like I said, I have a lot of drawn comb to put in there. So I mean, you don't put you don't you don't put a lot of drawn comb in there. You only put oh. one, or, one or two in some swarm lore. Okay. You know, okay. So, and you Thank put you. the darkest, ugliest comb you have in there. Well, I got some of that. <laughs> yeah. right, Bill, then the next question, what's your take on polystyrene hives since we're on on insulation topics? They're fine. You know, there's a there's a number of them. There, as a matter of fact, if um, if you look at the emerging list of bee equipment out there, it's all polystyrene. You know, the Lyson makes a group. B Max makes. Um, I mean, Lyson has product offerings. Uh, uh, B Max has product offerings. There's a couple of other. Uh, there's the Lauren will hates will hate the. Lauren, you hate this. Hey, Pame, do not waste your money. I got to sell these things. She don't buy it. Don't waste your money at it, Pame. Oh, my God, I can't stand them. Yeah. <laughs> they have a lot of little parts, don't they? Um, it's not that they have a lot of little parts. It's that they have design flaws that are tragic. Like the way that they seal together, um, you just have to kill a lot of bees. There's no way that you're not killing a lot of bees when you seal it. To oh. me... When I first got it, I, there are workarounds now, but I couldn't do an OAV because it would melt uh, the, the plastic. Hive. Yeah, the plastic. And the feeder on top is non functional. And, you know, ventilation. I don't use ventilation in the winter. I use. Yeah, and there's plenty of it in there. Um, yeah. So uh, I was not at all a fan of the fan of the Ape of May. All right, so um, there's a negative review for the Ape The other ones are just pretty much straightforward. Um, so uh, yeah, so I think that they're fine. You know, I know that they use them in really hot climates uh, because bees have a tendency to want to stay inside of them in hot climates because they, um, they, they can control the heat better when they have an insulated shell around them. 
And uh, in the winter, of course, they're already magically insulated. So I would look at I would look at the licensed version. I'd also look at the Bmax if you wanted to buy something um, from the United States. But I saw I must have seen ten different manufacturers at manufacturers at um, at the World Conference April Monday in uh, in uh, Montreal, the last one I was able to attend, and. Um, and uh, yeah, and there were, and there was just, just it was just the thing, insulated colonies. So it's coming, it's coming to us. What else we got, Jose? Okay, so at the end of uh, maybe Deborah needs to uh, get ready to jump in here, but her question is this: At the end of July, my honey super was nearly full of honey. I took a few frames and added a second honey super. August, I saw lots of bearding. Opened it up, and the honey super was deplete of honey. Any advice? on what I could have done to preserve the honey. I did not feed, but realized I should have. Well, um, you know, you could have uh, removed the honey when you found the super was full, but then you could have killed the bees. So it's really important to understand this. If you're gonna harvest honey, you should make certain that you're not in a dearth because remember your bees depended on that honey. They were depending on those stores to live. And the reason that you saw them, um, uh, that they vacated all the honey out of that super, assuming that they didn't get robbed or there wasn't anything else occurring that made that honey disappear like that. If they just ate back through it. Now, is that what they did? They just ate That's back what I think. Yeah, that's you what I think. Yeah, you didn't see any um, irregularities like- um, No jagged edges on the cells or anything like that no and, and yeah so you so you, your signs of and did the colonies die no okay they're fine yeah so um so if you harvested you'd have to know about your flow at the time and if you did that um then you could just feed them after that and you'd have your honey. well yeah that was the problem i i took out a couple frames you know to make sure that they had a, a little bit of room to, to continue producing. And then I added the other honey super thinking they were gonna need it, but it was the end of July. So they were going into a dearth and that's what they did to preserve yeah, I'm themselves. Guess, I'm, I'm guessing they did go into a dearth and they, and they ate back their stores. It's exactly yeah. what they're, they're designed to do. Right. And the fall flow would come on and they would be able to store some more honey in the fall. Right. You know, so that's, yeah. that's the natural process and see a lot well, of that's what I figured. I just wanted to make sure ask. Yeah. Well, so if you can figure out, you know, what blooms are available in your area and what time of year they're available. Like I have a bloom calendar that has 60 or 70 plants on it. I'll start showing it next month and you'll be able to see how I have a history of um, blooms that I've followed over the years, index species. That I know bees in my area for John, and if Walter pays me enough money, I'll send him a spreadsheet so he can see it. And then uh, you'll know you'll know exactly what is actually uh, blooming in in the time of year you want to harvest. And if that's not blooming, then you'll know you might run into a dearth. So then you have to feed. So very very um, your question is very um, pertinent to to. Um, the art of beekeeping. Yeah, exactly. Yep, it's not all science. <laughs> no, it's not all science. There's plenty of art in it. Okay, thank you. Okay, what do we so got here, Jose? The next one, Kathy asks: the frames that I have from my hive that I lost have been frozen uh, and okay, even with old brood. Wait, I'm not sure I understand. Yeah, that. yeah, they're all, yeah, they're okay. The old brood, she froze it with old brood in it. That's fine. Oh, I see. Yep. Yeah, they'll clean that out. If you want to reuse that frame, they'll clean it out. Assuming that, by the way, again, I want to preface every single time I answer questions about reusing old equipment, you have to make certain that there was no American foul brood or a foul brood disease that you haven't identified or you know, really greasy looking caps that had little pinholes in the top of them lots of indications that you might have had a brood disease. So if a colony dies from a brood disease, then you can't reuse those frames until you diagnose what brood disease it was. And that's that's probably a, a 
a good time to also uh, maybe uh, go back to uh, what Lynn was, Lynn's iPad was saying earlier in terms of getting uh, boxes from, from another beekeeper to the extent that you buy things uh, from, from someone else, uh, the state laws require that they be inspected. So before they sell that equipment, uh, bees, brood comb, frames, or hives, when they've been in use, with or without combs, uh, they have to be first inspected by the state inspector who has to issue a certificate of health uh, saying that they're free of contagious diseases, you know, mites, parasitic organisms, et cetera. Um, so just let's, let's make a note of that. And uh, maybe also I should say for uh, the new beekeepers here that uh, there is a state requirement that your uh, hives be registered. You have to register your hives with the state every year. It doesn't cost anything, but there is a requirement to register your hives. And there's a good reason for that. There's lots of good reasons for it. And one is that if there is a disease spread a disease in the area, then, then the bee inspector will notify you that there's been an outbreak of American fowl brood, say, for instance. That's the only one he'd probably talk about. And then you'd know, um, not much you could do about it, but you'd know that there was an outbreak in your area. So that it is pretty good to know that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah. Um, and Dean yeah, just put up a wonderful yeah, link for you yeah. to follow. Uh, um, which uh, will allow you to register your colonies. You thought there's videos showing you how to do it. It's very easy, actually. But they use the uh, licensing uh, portal. And, and um, th they will, once you make this application, you will right. get a little uh, uh, license number, and then you can put that in a box, and then you can tell them how many colonies you have. So it's very, very uh, painless once you get started. Yeah. And not that people ought to be interested, but here are the laws that I was talking about. Now, All I right. thought I saw Chesity on here somewhere. Where's Chesity? Oh, is that right? He he came on. I Where's he hiding? I didn't see him. Okay. Yeah, I'm oh, here. There he is. How's everybody doing? Where is he? Good, Skip. How you doing? Yeah, not too bad. I'm the guy with the uh, hot dog on that skewer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, I guess I, I guess I have a quick question for you, you folks. Um, every year when I get started, I look at what happened last year, and this past year, I'm knocking on wood because all of my hives and all of my clients' hives survived. So I'm a little bit nervous because I don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of months when I really start looking into what's going on. But I think it would be good to know when do you start feeding in the early spring to help them uh, make wax if you have to draw out comb? And then when do you stop so that they can make honey in the supers without getting sugar syrup in there? Is that um, a key issue? Yeah, I mean, it's it's not really a problem if you're if you're coming out of winter, and you have um, so there's a background radio or something. Yeah, that that I think that skip there, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So go silent, skip for. There me. you go, skip. I muted you. Um. So um. So if all of your clients and yours your colonies come through the winter it it's so here's the thing with beekeeping that situation requires more skill than if your bees die <laughs> i mean if your bees die you buy a package of bees or you do something else and you, you do splits and you increase your colonies and you go back on your feet but when you've got 25 colonies that come through as boomers now you've got to be a beekeeper in really a serious way and now if you're going to try to draw comb um, the telltale sign, bees will not draw wax until they have the right temperature in the colony and that you see frost wax on the top bars or on the edges of, of uh, the shoulders where, where they're storing honey. Once that pure white wax starts to appear, you can then put on 
uh, foundation supers and they'll draw wax. What they're indicating to you is they have no more space. Every available cell in the brood box is occupied with either nectar, capped honey, pollen, or brood, and that they have no other place to put it. So they start drawing out deeper cells on the shoulders, and they can start doing all kinds of things like that. But that's your indication. That, that's a skill you have to develop. You have to learn what that frost wax looks like on top of frames. I'm gonna take some photographs of that this year because I have very, very sketchy photographs of it, but I wanna make sure everybody knows that because people will put frames of um, empty foundation on colonies, supers, at the wrong time of year. And then they'll always ask this question, you know, my bees didn't do anything. They wouldn't build any comb at all for me. And, and the reason that they didn't build any comb is that they placed that equipment on the colony at the wrong time, all right? So, um, so then I wouldn't feed them if I had them in that situation because they've got a good flow coming on. They'll build wax and they'll put honey in it, honey in the super. You can get them to do both. If you are feeding to draw out comb, I would do that in the fall. Right, I would try, if you wanted to do that, I mean, it, it can be done, it's a little tricky, but you can do it in the previous season. And then you'll have in those combs, you'll have sugar water because they, um, you're gonna feed them until they draw comb on that super and then they're gonna backfill with um, sugar water. Then you spin that out and you can use that the next year for your drawn comb. It's a great way to do it. It's nice clean comb. You can do it, it's a little tricky and, um, um, anytime I draw comb, I'm just looking for that signs that the colony's ready to draw, and then I put on I put on supers there. I don't know. Uh, so Skip, you're going to have a really um, interesting spring if all your clients. You're going to have to run around and manage swarms, and you're going to have to um, super up early on everything. You got to be out there, you know, before dandelions and super the thing up. I wouldn't put one super on colonies. I put more than one. You know, if, there, if you have drawn comb supers, if you have, um, um, you know, foundation, you're going to have to draw that out one one frame, one box at a time. They won't do anything with multiple boxes of foundation. So, um, yeah, I have about twenty five frames that uh, I spun out <clears throat> toward the end of the year that I saved. Yeah. So they're they're all drawn, but they're empty. So I'm planning on putting those in, um, you know, ahead of the first flow to get, get them ready. Yeah. You, you, does that make sense? Yes, it does. But like I'm saying, if you've got drawn supers and you've got boomers, you put a couple on. Right. More than, more than one is what I'm saying, you know, on, on a colony. Gotcha. Thanks a lot. But one is better than none. <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, if you, look, I'll, I'll put them, I'll put three, if I have a really strong colony, I might put three supers on that colony. And what happens is- No, right from the start with the right, three? Right from the, right from the start, yeah. It does two things for me. It gets my, my drawn supers out of storage and onto colonies. And for the bees, they are uh, biologically adapted to hoard. And the, um, the, the existence of- uh, drawn comb and their biology uh, work together so that they uh, go nuts and store honey up in those supers. You will get, you can stimulate a good, strong colony in a good, strong flow can be stimulated by multiple supers to store more honey than it normally would. That's the biology of bees. What are we doing here? How's the time? Is this over? It's eight o'clock. Look, we're going to have to. Let you guys time go. flies. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I just want to say this was one of the best. I mean, every every month this thing gets better for me, anyway. And um, I want to thank you all for coming, and for those of you who feel uh, motivated to join uh, CBA, and if you're not, please do. Your $30 contribution will be welcomed on many levels.